record here. Uh, this is our December meeting for uh, Central Iowa Linux Users Group. And uh, welcome. Uh, so we have a website at cialug.org. And uh, there are links there to our email list, IRC, and uh, the uh, Slack channel, which there's a bridge between the two. So whether you're uh, new school or old school, you can talk to everybody still, and uh, usually it works. If it doesn't, yell at me because I need to restart it. Uh, so usually we start out with uh, Linux news here. Uh, this week I'm going to be uh, uh, taking over since it's uh, apparently time for semester tests and somebody thought studying was more important. I, I mean, geez, come on. Anyway, uh, they, that's perfectly fine. And uh, is more important. <laughs> yeah, it, pa passing seems to be a good investment. And uh, the, this month, it seemed really fitting to have the flaming uh, news, just because it's been an interesting month. Uh, in non Linux news, uh, as a piece of performance art, you can actually email a flaming dumpster fire and it will print it out your uh, email and burn it for you. So it, it, a fitting uh, thing for this year. Uh, so in the non, start, starting from non-controversial and go, working to the, the CentOS mess at the end there, uh, Linux 5.10 uh, was released. It's a long-term uh, edition. Uh, so if you jump on it, you've got till 2026 to get off of it then. Uh, what happened, they improved a bunch of drivers uh, ButterFS uh, has some performance bumps. XT4 has some more performance bumps. Uh, the AMD Zen Processor 3 has uh, uh, some support now. Uh, there's a Linux smartphone phone uh, that now is supported. Sound Blaster has a real cool USB-based uh, uh, sound card that, or Bluetooth, I'm, I can't remember which one it was that uh, now supported uh, if you're a switch player or you have an old sega saturn controller laying around it's now supported so you can play all those linux games uh with them which is great if you have steam uh and now you can boot uh kernels for uh mips processors that have been compressed with zstd and risk uh five uh, processors will now boot with EFI firmware. Uh, the other real nice thing is apparently Hibernate and Resumes are faster because they batched up all the IO, IO requests into a more sane sort of way. And yeah, other than that, nothing earth shattering, but some real nice to haves in there. Raspberry Pi has a new OS uh, bump out. Uh, they're now using Pulse Audio instead of Alsa, so that not gets you... ex Sorry, go go ahead. Um, that's not tr entirely true. They're using Pulse Audio instead of um, the other one, um, the mixer that's usually on top of Alsa. Okay. Uh news was apparent the news site i i read was apparently glossing over things but yeah. anyway glossing over good things. news is it's now using a the pulse audio system so bluetooth and a bunch of other stuff should play a lot nicer now uh, they have cups installed by default and also the nice graphical system config printer so things will be better if you're uh, hard of seeing uh the Orca screen reader is working better for you now. There's a cool new toy to play with the LED lights on your board. They bumped Chromium and Python and uh, the latest Flash player, uh, which by the way, if you're using Flash, start making your piece now because it's dead. It's not just merely dead, but they're about to drop a house on it. Uh, there's now your battery monitor will warn you when you're in low voltage uh, conditions. 
and it's still using uh, kernel uh, 5.4 under the hood, but you still have a really long time that it's supported. So you, you've got a couple years to worry about that yet. Uh, the uh, za reason, which apparently sold Linux devices is uh, shut down and exited due to uh, COVID-19 related issues. Uh, it's tough out there. And uh, the other fun uh, article I read about was uh, Twake, which is supposed to be somewhere between like a Nextcloud alternative slash a Kanban board slash project management sort of stuff. It might be worth uh, talking about here in a, another few months about uh, how to use it and is it worthwhile and all that stuff because I mean uh, we, we all need another uh, jury killer out there because I wish someone would uh, pound a stake into it. And now for the freaking out part because I mean I'm freaking out man. Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, so there was a news article out uh, about how they were getting rid of so Kubernetes no longer would use Docker. The, the good news is really what's changed. It's uh, uh, they're, they're not going through the Docker container engine. They're uh, getting rid of it. You still can use your Docker images that you know and love, your registries, etc. Everything will feel about the same. Uh, command line, now you'll use CRI, CTL instead of uh, Docker to play with some stuff. There's some documentation on why and what. So basically what, what's ending up happening is uh, currently you go and there's this Docker shim and then it talks to Docker, which then talks to run C. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Moving forward, now there isn't. They, they got rid of the Docker parts and are now talking directly to run C. So Things should work better uh, if you don't even have Docker on your machine. So that means like uh, uh, for Podman and stuff like that, you and any of the, the things that are uh, the uh, CRI compatible run C sort of stuff, you, it just will work still. And it's yet another uh, death knell to Docker as a whole, but uh, the, the Docker environment still will live on. Hopefully I, I got that right uh, for your you uh, 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 Kubernetes aficionados out there. I'm but just a, a dabbler. And then the one that generated the most heartburn, uh, the Red Hat uh, CentOS uh, kerfluffle. Currently the way that things work is for like say CentOS 8, which is this machine right here. The, the flow of packages go from Fedora into Red Hat and then into CentOS. Well, they're now getting rid of CentOS 8 basically, which I'll, I'll get into here in a minute, but now it will be basically from Fedora. Uh, CentOS Stream will basically be a um, Red Hat point release beta so they're, they're going to make the open community do all their testing, and then it, uh, it will roll into Red Hat. So when will that happen? Uh, one of the big problems that people are mildly ticked off about this, and or slightly more than mildly, uh, was that CentOS's um, 8's end of life was scheduled to be 2029. And since a bunch of people just came off of CentOS 6, they installed the latest greatest. Well, now the end of life is December 2021. And uh, basically going forward, there will be no new releases of uh, CentOS uh, 8 or anything like CentOS 9 when uh, Red Hat 9 comes out someday. So the good news is it's not the end of the universe. Why did people like CentOS uh, 8? Because if you wanted a uh, ultra stable business centric uh, Linux and didn't want to pay Red Hat for uh, support, CentOS was your guy. Unfortunately, uh, a few years back, 
or fortunately, depending on which side of the, the fence you're on, uh, Red Hat pretty much acquired all of uh, CentOS and was doing both the free and not free releases as in beer. And uh, so now that they, and a bunch of places like uh, uh, Scientific Linux decided, hey, you know, we're duplicating effort. There's no point for us to do this. So we're just not going to make a new release. Just say, hey, go to CentOS. Well, now, now that CentOS isn't in that game anymore, there are at least two major forks that uh, were announced in the last couple days. And then also you can have Oracle Linux is also a fork in a similar way, but I mean, it, there's debates on whether or not you want to trust uh, uh, Oracle to be your Linux distro because Oracle's done stuff in the past too. So the, the whole nother issue there though. So anyway, though, uh, the, this just sort of reminded me of a few uh, Star Wars memes of, uh, it wasn't CentOS that everyone was uh, uh, so enamored with. It was the fact that it was free. And uh, one of the, the big concerning things was uh, Red Hat basically came out and said, hey, you know, uh, if this new uh, CentOS stream thing won't uh, fit your needs, you know, you can always talk to us about getting a license instead. And so uh, it's sort of becoming the Streisand effect of, uh, well, no, people are ticked off and now going to leave it and or go to a different distro. So uh, the, the other meme that I didn't put in here was the Darth Vader, I've altered the terms of our agreement, pray I don't alter them further sort of thing. So there's a bunch of rather irritated people on the, the Twitterverse, more so than normal. So news-wise, anyone have any other news that I missed? Uh, um, I have some news. Sure, go ahead. Um, so if anyone's been paying attention to HashiCorp, they've had a lot of recent uh, announcements um, with some of the uh, tooling, like uh, Terraform with the SDK recently. But they just went 1.0 with... Uh, Oh, what is it called? Uh, Apache, or sorry, oh, sorry, HashiCorp um, Nomad. And what HashiCorp Nomad is, is a, uh, it's a Kubernetes alternative that plays in very nicely with the entire ecosphere of all the HashiCorp Enterprise products. Now, why should you care when there's already Kubernetes um, kind of playing the container orchestration field that uh, Nomad's supposed to play? reason why out of the box it's easier to set up than kubernetes um i would argue not as easy as k3s from rancher but it is um it's it allows you to do multi-regional support and multi-tenant and multi-ingress right out of the box very easily with the whole hashicorp enterprise suite so for this reaching 1.0 maturity um, is absolutely phenomenal. And they did a test where they deployed over 2 million containers across 10 different AWS regions in less than 20 minutes. So they're, uh, they're very confident. And if anyone's late to the game with uh, Kubernetes I and they want to pay the money for support that they're supposed to get with OpenShift, uh, we're playing around with Nomad at, at work right now. And so far, I'm really liking what I'm seeing um, just in case anyone's curious. Very cool. Uh, the, the other piece of news that I did remember uh, for anyone who's a software developer, uh, Advent of Code is currently going on. So if you want some fun uh, sort of uh, bubblegum projects to chew on and or slightly more than bubblegum, depending on the day, uh, there are a bunch of uh, problems to solve if you have the time. I started out on it and I uh, have some catching up to do because I've been a little bit elbow deep in various other projects as well. So uh, anyway, though, there's uh, plenty of other things to do on your uh, holiday vacation here. Oh, and feel free to join the Discord where we have a uh, Advent of Code channel and a PhD in ComSci who's playing around with multiple languages to answer questions as you have them. Yeah, if it uh, doesn't make you feel less uh, 
or more inadequate than I already feel. Yeah, Walt's kind of good like that. But just know he comes from uh, his heart's in the right place. Oh, uh, le- uh, a quick two two cents on the uh, Docker shim removal from Kubernetes. Um, just let you know, Container D was uh, spun off from Docker already, and a lot of uh, Kubernetes are uh, distributions are using um, Container D as the de facto. Uh, Container runtime for it. The only one that's using Cryo as the container runtime is uh, Red Hat, because Red Hat's trying to make it seem like they've made everything in house and they're all original. So um, just be aware. Yeah, it's not a huge uh, change. No, in my opinion, it actually made it better. Yeah, it really does long term makes the code simpler and everything easier. So for the most part, it's just a bunch of people getting rather irritable about almost nothing. Yeah, exactly. Lee, I saw you go off of uh, mute there. Did you have something to add as well? Uh, I didn't realize I did. I was waiting for a minute I could chime in and say, and you expected IBM to do anything less with Red Hat? No, they but they have burnt a whole lot of uh, goodwill on this one. Yeah, that, that's why I picked Susie 20 years ago. Anyway, I'll shut up. Yeah, Seuss and uh, Debian and almost everyone else except for Ascent uh, slash Red Hat is definitely going to gain market share off of this. Les is definitely the de facto choice that I would go with if I were in the space. Yeah, I I just installed Scent on this machine because I was uh, wanting to get a little bit more experience with Scent 8 uh, if we were going to be doing anything uh, professionally at work uh, since for some reason uh, uh, all of our stuff is uh, Scent 7 currently. And so... I'm not sure what the HPC world is going to look like here in the next little bit. Oh, I can tell you. Um, actually, I can't. Um, I can. I know who will be making the announcement in the HPC world. Now, are we talking like real HPC here, or are we just talking like clustered systems with a scheduler on it? Uh, so, technically, we're we're a real HPC, but. It gets abused more in the the large amount of cluster cluster with scheduling sort of stuff, each running individually in jobs. Okay, um, I will comment as soon as I'm told I can release it. What uh, the government's doing with uh, Titan and other supercomputers in that same area? HPC stands for High Performance Computing. So think uh, think a very moderate to somewhat good laptop with insanely fast network speeds for IO capability. Yeah, uh, we're, we're a very IBM shop, so it's B sub and all that all the way down. Yeah. GPFS and what have you. Oh, there's some fun ones in there. Oh, yes, there's been all sorts of heartburn, but they, that's a talk for a whole different uh, day. But, we'll say that for when we don't have a normal topic. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, though, uh, so if you, you haven't figured out, uh, I'm going to be the one presenting tonight. Uh, by day, uh, I'm a software specialist uh, doing uh research IT stuff for a large North American seed corn company. And by night, I happen to be the president of the local Linux users group. If anyone wants to run in an election, just let me know. You'll probably be able to get an office real uh, quickly. Uh, So afterwards, I'm going to post the slides to uh, both my site and I'm on Twitter as well as Slack and IRC and all those sort of things. So yeah. uh, I, I'm around and uh, here for the next couple of weeks, not really doing all that much while trying to work on personal projects. So I'll, I'll definitely respond if anyone says something. 
but so on to the the actual topic of the night. Uh, last month there was sort of a uh, comment about, boy, you know, I, I'd like to know how to orchestrate containers together, and uh, sort of move on from the Docker Compose sort of world. And so the the title of this one sort of is Docker, local Kubernetes for dummies, or so you want to move away from Docker Compose. And so just to sort of touch, uh, we've talked a little bit about Kubernetes in the past. And uh, I admit I was one of the ones that I've sort of abused uh, Docker Compose beyond what probably is sane or healthy. And now that I'm moving away from doing production code into more prototypic code, I, I can get away with using our uh, local Kubernetes cluster uh, without getting uh, yelled at for uh, misusing things. So I, I'm definitely going to be getting my feet wet a little bit more. So as a little bit of a review, uh, Docker, the way that I always like to think about it, I know that it isn't, and it's a total abuse of the the idea, but I think of uh, Docker as a bunch of little VMs all on my machine that are jailed away from each other so you can't talk from one app to the other. Now, of course, it really isn't. Uh, in a VM, you've got the uh, guest OS, and so you could have Windows over here and Linux over here and uh, something else running over here. And separate so, kernels. Yeah, separate kernels. Where here, uh, you share the guest OS is kernel, and the only thing that's actually running inside of your jail is your app and what files that you bring along with it. So it's a lot lighter than a VM, and uh, you're, you're a little bit constrained in the fact that uh, you're sharing the same kernel. So if you need a different kernel, you're SOL but uh, you still have that nice jail. And really the, the biggest thing about Docker is it's bringing together all of the different networking and the, uh, the containerization and everything all into one nice, easy to use package. But one of the big problems is this is one machine. And so at one point you're, you're going to get beyond where it will all fit on one machine. And also, uh, if that machine happens to get hit by a meteor, well, that's too bad because it's dead. So, uh, as I said, you don't have that orchestration. So if you want to stand up a LAMP stack, so Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, et cetera, really the best practice is each individual component there needs to be on its own Docker container running separately of everything else and getting network permissions all right. And really in the end, you're just shifting the snowflake up to the, uh, so that you can run a whole bunch of little tiny cattle on your one snowflake machine. And uh, it, it still is just a problem. And eventually you grow beyond that one machine, no matter how big you bu uh, build it, if you're lucky enough. So, of course, you're going to need a bigger boat. Hey, Andrew. Yes. Are you thinking that you're sharing your screen? I should be showing sharing my screen. No, I'm not saying it. OK, well, that's a problem. Uh... I mean, it didn't detract from how awesome that that was or your intro was so far. So don't worry there. Right. So one second here while I uh, uh, let's see how do I get into this sorry about that uh, we'll be underway here in just one second here Unfortunately, the other bug that I found in uh, uh, CentOS here is apparently the way that I'm running it here. Uh, entire screen. Okay, can people see my screen now? 
No change. Nope. Uh, Are we running into some kind of issue with uh, some updated clients or something? Uh, so the, the issue is, it is telling me that I'm sharing my screen right now. Uh, the, the issue is uh, CentOS, Um, did you give that other client permission? To be so able to the share? other client is myself uh, still, so it has permission to be sharing. Hmm. I am uh, so sorry here. Let me quick uh, jump computers here and uh, get on the Windows side because I know that will work. I think the Linux client, if you recently updated, had some changes to it. I noticed that with my um, desktop, I'm having some issues with Arch Linux. Um, and they posted a lot of patch notes about uh, an updating client. Yeah, so the problem I'm running into is that it's not uh, uh, liking my, uh, um, it wants me to be running Wayland instead of X. So. I can see James' screen now. Yep. So we'll. Uh, force it here. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so we're mm -hmm. over in the w Windows side of things, unfortunately, but hey, we'll we'll make it work here. And the demo will be a little more interesting because we'll have to have maybe someone else uh, uh, share here. Either if Will will want to take over showing uh, something. Yeah, I can't as... use my laptop at, or I can't use my uh, Linux box at all either. So I'm in the same uh, boat you are. Well, demos might get a little bit interesting here then because uh, it's going to be one of those days. So let's see here, going through the news, uh, it basically is everything that I just said. Uh, so I'm freaking out, man. Yeah, you are freaking out, man. Uh, Kubernetes and showing uh, what I was talking about there where it's going from taking that Docker shim and getting rid of it. Uh, the CentOS moving that moving uh, CentOS from upstream downstream to upstream now, and yeah. Uh, so here we are back again in the shortcomings, and of course you're going to need a bigger boat. So uh, one of the options that you can go with is Docker Swarm, and Personally, I really like uh, the, the idea of Docker Swarm. It's very uh, simple, very elegant. But of course, the, the biggest problem is because I like it, clearly it's not the winner. And uh, basically, usually the way that I go about looking at a technology stack is if I like that option, I know that it's not gonna stick around. I, I've had the same problem with JavaScript uh, libraries, usually about two or three years after I, I back it and think, hey, this is great, I love it. It turns into the, the Yahoo uh, uh, JavaScript library stuff. And yeah, definitely have to drop it off my resume because it's no longer worth anything. But so anyway, though, the, the idea is that you have a bunch of worker nodes and then an individual or a uh, manager that, a set of managers that uh, collaborate between each other with the Raft uh, protocol. So basically, once everyone gets the same water level, then, or at least a consensus uh, gets to a, the same water level, then that's the, the truth. It, it works. It's not nearly as elegant or nice as what uh, Kubernetes is, but it's a lot easier and it's easier to set up. 
it also is very Docker centric, which also means that it's probably I wouldn't want to rely on it because the industry has gone the other direction. Yeah, it's uh, due for end of life, I think, in within the next two years, maybe even end of uh, 2021. Yeah, so uh, yet again, don't don't bother with it now, even though it is easy and elegant and also not really sustainable. So the other option is Kubernetes. It is an open source ecosystem. And uh, basically, you can run your container uh, planet scale. So if you're Google or if you're that guy running it on your Raspberry Pi, it doesn't matter. It's the same tech stack, the same commands. Use it once. You can use it anywhere, provided that uh, you can compile it for your uh, CPU set. I'm and not going to admit I've done this, but it can also run on cell phones. You scientists were so busy uh, figuring out if you could, you never stopped to ask if you should. Oh, we did. What do you think uh, led us down that path? Uh, so uh, the, the good news is you can run it on-prem, you can run it in the cloud, you can run it apparently on your cell phone uh, or a hybrid of all three. So you can run on your, your base load there on your on-premise and when you need a little bit extra legroom, that's okay. You can pop out into Google or Amazon or heaven forbid Azure and uh, it's okay. You can spin up, spin down, grow your cluster, whatever you need to do, it's fairly easy. And by easy, I mean, it's really, really hard, but it's Kubernetes, so there's nothing easy here. But sort of if you notice the the idea still uh, sort of is close to what that uh, Docker uh, swarm looks like where you have nodes and you have a control uh, plane of uh, control servers and et cetera. Same ideas, just a little bit different. So again, why Kubernetes? It's the industry standard because it's standard Everybody has documentation on how to do it. And also you don't have to worry about, okay, I wrote my code so that it can run in a Lambda. Well, now we're switching from Lambdas over from in AWS over to uh, Azure, uh, whatever the heck they call Lambdas Function. and everything changed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and everything's changed. So all of my stuff doesn't quite play nice anymore. It doesn't matter. It's all running inside of Kubernetes. So it, you develop it locally, and when you go to deploy, it's easy. And it's also been the winner of the, the battle of the clusters, as much as Docker protests and complains about it. There's also a Cloud Native Foundation graduated project, which means it's uh, going to stay firmly open source and Google can't retract it or end of life it. Which is good because Google ends of life's almost everything. Especially yeah. again, once I actually like it. Google, I'm still throwing shade at you for uh, Google News. How about Google Reader? Yeah, the, the, yes, that's what I mean. The, the Google Reader uh, end of lifing. As well as Google Photos, uh, them clawing back their uh, promise of unlimited uh, photos. Apparently their AI now has enough pictures to train off of. But that's a topic for another day. So let's talk about orchestration. So Docker Compose is, again, the, the easy one that is just simple, easy. And uh, at the base level, yes, I know you can run it in Docker Swarm, but uh, you're just setting it up to run on your local dev machine. So you can tell it, okay, I need these networks set up and the, these images can talk to this, etc. It's where everyone gets their start on. It's real easy. And in theory, apparently they now have it where you can talk to Kubernetes as well. But again, I'd be really hesitant on going with it because it is not the, the standard and no one's doing it that way, basically unless you're paying for the corporate edition of uh, Docker desktop, and then you, you have other problems that we won't even talk about there. I work at, said, at one of the said companies. We have those problems, can confirm. Yeah, so anyway though, uh, 
so instead of uh, Docker Compose, the, the industry standard version is Helm. And basically th the way that I like to think of it is it is a Docker for Kubernetes packages. So basically if you want to stand up a uh, WordPress site, there's a Helm chart for that. And you just say, hey, I want this uh, WordPress site to go, and here are a few configurations around it, and go. And it will stand one up for you, and everything is awesome, and you don't have to worry about, okay, first I have to build my, and get my database uh, uh, Docker Compose stuff all set up, and then I need to do this, and I, I need to network them all together, and all of that. It's a lot of stuff that you don't have to do and you shouldn't have to do because I, as a developer, I'm going to get it wrong. I know I'm not going to get my database configured right. I'm going to get the security wrong. It's easy to screw up. If someone else do, did it, the, the idea that if everyone's using the same stack, many eyes are going to uh, catch the, the problems, hopefully, maybe, I hope. So uh, the, the three big uh, concepts that you're going to worry about here are uh, chart, uh, config, and release. So a chart is a bundle of information that's needed to create a Kubernetes app. And uh, then a config is basically the, the configuration information that's around that uh, app that basically what is your uh, password? What, what are the the uh, the name of your uh, blog? What, what are all of those things? And yes, I know you shouldn't put passwords in your config files that are unencrypted or anything like that. It, anyway, so release is the final one and that's the uh, running instance of a chart with a config file. So inside a Helm, you can create new charts from scratch. You can package your charts into a chart archive, which much like the rest of the world, it's just a compressed file. I mean, heck, even Word documents are now just zip files. So the, the whole world is just compression all the way down. But you can also interact with your chart repositories. You can install and uninstall uh, charts into your Kubernetes cluster. And then you can also manage the release cycle. So do you want to do a rolling release? How, how do you want to handle all that networking around it? So how do I get Kubernetes and Helm installed? Well, so if you want to install Kubernetes, the, the full weight version of it, it's really hard, it's messy. You're gonna hate yourself. They, there's a lot easier ways to get your local version of Kubernetes running. Uh, Minikube is uh, probably the, the more standardized version of it. It is sort of halfway between the Kubernetes and uh, uh, the uh, K3S, which by the way, Kubernetes uh, is often abbreviated as K8S because uh, various reasons. Eight letters between K and S. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, I, I, I froze there for a second. Uh, so K3S is uh, basically halfway between there. So ha ha ha, they just chopped the one end off. Apparently the, the marketing people absolutely hate them for it because it's so clever that the engineers loved it and that means marketing people hate it. I've been on the inside of some of those discussions. It's amazing how much they hate the K3 stuff. Um, but for reference, just to let you know, Andrew. Yes. Um, K3s is actually easier to install than Minikube. Uh, that, that's what I was going to get at here in a second. Sorry, but uh, so what? What I'm getting here with the uh, the requirements, they they want you to have at least two CPUs. You need two gigs of free memory, 20 gigs of free hard disk space, and then also an internet connection because that's whatever. Uh, but the big problem I did find on uh, CentOS 8 is that there's a bug that wasn't letting me install Minikube even. So, and uh, two gigs of free memory and all that stuff, that, that's pretty heavy. To install it, it it's fairly easy, uh, depending on which distro you want. Uh, 
basically you just download it and install the package. It, it, not much there. It, it's so easy, anyone can copy and paste that. So on to Kubernetes, or uh, sorry, uh, K3S. Uh, it's uh, sponsored and sort of loved by Rancher. And it's basically meant to run on your toaster. It can run on an arm, it can run on a IoT device, on the, the edge in a fog computing. You can run it probably on your cell phone if you wanted to. So funny line, that very last line for marketing my friend Jason Blum and I, when we did our first uh, K3s talk, we came up that with that line as part of our um, our uh, intro, and they loved the marketing people loved it so much they stole it. And so the the idea between behind K3s though is that they stripped out all of the cruft and the experimental stuff and all the stuff that you don't need of uh, Kubernetes to actually run it in a working sane cluster. So I like to think of K3S as Kubernetes, just the good parts to steal from a uh, uh, book uh, trope of titles. So to install it, it's just so stupid easy. You copy and paste that curl line there and basically just execute the shell and then after a little bit, you run and check and see if your uh, kubectl has uh, any nodes listed. It's just that simple. And of course, that, that's then bringing up the question of, is it actually a good idea to uh, just blindly run uh, curl scripts off the internet? Well, it's a calculated risk. But then again, I, I'm really bad at math, so YOLO. And plus, it's fairly trustworthy. There are checksums that you can uh, validate um, for K3s as well, if you want to take a look at that. Yes. It, and in the uh, sane world, you'd actually download the script, open it up, look at it, verify that they're not doing anything like rm-rf slash or any other shenanigans like that. Uh, but I mean, YOLO, I mean, you can just reinstall it from backup, right? So the idea is that uh, it's a stripped down version of uh, Kubernetes. You have your agent and uh, they're leveraging stuff like Flannel and uh, uh, SQL Lite and stuff like that uh, to, to uh, go with uh, um, James's uh, uh, state here a statement who has backups. Well, there, there are two types of people in the world, those who have lost data and those who will. So, but anyway though, so you have uh, flannel is your network uh, uh, sort of communication uh, area. And I mean, it, it's only the good parts of Kubernetes basically. So uh, if you have Docker desktop, there, there is an easy button uh, that really makes life easy, but boy, does it eat a lot of memory on your machine. Uh, so I know I'm talking about Windows here, but to be fair, I'm using w, WSL2, so it kind of counts. And really for that, you just go into your configuration menu, you click on Kubernetes, and then you just click enable Kubernetes and then hit apply. Wait 10 minutes for it to restart and congratulations, you have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you can also run K3s in a WSL, not even WSL2, and it will run. Um, just saying, because I'm doing that at work right now. Yeah, it makes sense. But anyway, if you want your nice integrated with uh, your Docker desktop and playing nice with things, there is a way. So then to install Helm, it's again with the curl commands. This is how you do it if you were responsible. So first you're downloading your Helm script, chain uh, ch modding it to 700 to make it executable and then executing it. In theory there, you're also supposed to be looking at your git Helm, uh, verifying that it matches the uh, 
checksums. the hashes and checksums and all that stuff. But hey, who has time for that stuff? You just run the curl, YOLO. So uh, basically it just downloads and it runs its install script. And uh, as you can see here, this is following their Debian uh, information. So you download it, you add it to uh, the sources list and then just run uh, the, the uh, apt-gets to install it here. Fairly easy, no muss, no fuss. So this is the point of the talk where I would be diving into actually doing things with it. But uh, as I can't share screens right now, the, I could talk you through while it's going, but it's going to be really disappointing. Dumb question. Can you SSH in that box from your Windows box and share your screen on that? I can possibly, if you give me one second to find out what IP address it is. OK. And then I also recommend using Git Bash for your SSH client versus Putty as it has better Windows integration with what you want to try to do. So let's see. Wow. Um, what was that you called it? Uh, called what? Git Dash. Yes. So when you download Git and you use the standard install on Windows, um, you get this tool called Git Bash. And I didn't know how powerful it was until I attended the B-Sides and I found out that, that uh, most security researchers will go in and that's the first thing they install. And it's got Vim in there, it has SSH, and, it, it, and you can even use like a Bash RC with it. But literally, it's Windows with a min GW uh, basic, you know, you know, Linux build, and some basic tools that I use every day. So, and you can in, in the SSH with it, um, you can actually make an SSH config. Works great. And it's faster than the uh, WSL or WSL2 on the command prompt. Okay, so here we go. PowerShell and SSH seem to work. Okay, so. But I will look at it. James seems to think it, it's slow. I mean, it's when you're on Windows and not using anything that's a We'll take that back. Even PowerShell is slow on Windows. So um, Windows and Typey Typey is slow, but out of all of them, I have noticed that uh, a Git Bash is faster than anything else offered. Okay, so let's just play with some stuff here. No guarantees that this will work well because the way today is going, why not? So we have... Uh, So so just to prove that we're running here, none of my stuff is running or uh, is the way that I expected it, but uh, uh, let's just, uh, so first we're going to add our uh, Helm, the, the Bitnami uh, repo here for uh, charts. But uh, what, we can't see anything, Andrew. I should be screen sharing here. Can you see the screen? No, uh, we are seeing your slides. Sharing your slides, so that, not your yeah. Oh, okay. Let, let's switch our screen share here then. Going to be one of those days today. Apparently, I didn't. Uh, uh... Uh, that's okay. It's all that Windows crap floating around in your head that muck, mucks it up. Okay, hopefully we can see the, the full uh, we, screen here now. We do. Awesome. Well, so anyway, K3S, it, here's their, their install. And li like I said, it, they make it really easy. So if we want to just prove that things are running and up and working. Uh, we've got... Uh, Apparently, for some reason, it thinks that there's another one running, but 
Did you whatever? Click... Oh, you didn't share a, the Docker um, desktop Kubernetes, did you? Because they may try to talk to each other. Because the because look if if you look at that that v dot one nineteen dot three, looks like that's the same version of Kubernetes from Docker Desktop. Okay, that's odd because I am. I'm pretty sure that I'm SSH'd into uh, my the Linux box down here, and it apparently is seeing the. So uh, the... let's do this. Um, can you do a vim on your dot or, or you're told that your home directory? Yeah, yeah, you're in there. Dot cube and then uh, K U B E config. No dot config in there, it's dot cube config. No, no, no dot, no dot. Yeah, okay, so it's not finding it. All righty then. Um, all right, so another trick. Uh, uh, do you have kubectl installed in this machine? Yeah. Like regular kubectl? Yep. Yep. Okay. And then just type in nodes there. Or get nodes, I mean. No hyphen. No, in a space, I meant, sorry. <laughs> Let's go through all the permutations. Ah, okay. So try doing this. Um, it's. Um... Do this. Uh, do Make sure that you have a uh, sudo. And do a change mod to just make it 755. 755. And then for space Etsy slash rancher threat slash Keith. Uh, yeah, rancher as in the company. Yep, hit tab. Yep. K3s slash K3s dot YAML. Yep. All right, copy that k3s.yaml into your .cube folder. And actually, you might have to go in there. Change it to K8S. Uh, no, change it to config, not K, not k 8 yaml And no, no dot yaml at the end, just config. OK. All right. There we go. Yeah, so now if you vim into that config file, and if you scroll down, there should be two clusters, and it's trying to connect to, I think, both. I can't confirm that. It looks like it might be one. No, it's two. Scroll up, because you have two, two clusters listed. Yeah, there now. we go, yeah. So if you just go all the way to the top, uh, sh uh, GG. And if you bump that font maybe twice. Control shift. Yep. Boom. Much better. Thanks. Uh, okay, no, that's so point just... cluster. So it looks like it's just K3s has got multiple data. So at some point you tried to join them. Regardless, it doesn't matter. It's not going to impact yeah, it, things. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, that other uh, cluster doesn't exist right now anyway. So we'll, we'll just go with it. So, uh, Anyway, though, proving that we are running here. And then, so let's up the size here a bit. Uh, 
So to install this uh, word, the default version of this WordPress, it, it's really, really simple. You just uh, after, uh, so first step is you have to add the, the repo uh, for the chart, and then you just copy and paste that and hit return. Apparently I already have it running here. Uh, so if we go into their configurations here, it will show us what. Uh, um, can we see if you have anything installed on the system first? Like, can you do a kubectl get deployment? Space, no, hold on, up. And then do dash dash all dash namespaces. Okay, so what you're going to want to do, uh, do a uh, kubectl get ns as in November Sierra. Yeah, and then just do a kubectl delete ns and then put um, WordPress in there and we'll do a fresh install. So this way, because your previous work won't muddy everything up. There we go. Mm -hmm. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna delete all your configuration files, your name, like literally anything associated with the namespace. Did you have any persistent volume set up with this? Uh, not unless they, it came along for free. I, so I didn't do any. Let's go take a look any. quick before we do that because otherwise this Helm will fail. So do a cube CTL get PV. Uh, looks like and there are. Aha, yep. There we go. We do want to delete those. So do a cube CTL or get uh, you want to do a cube CTL. So it's cube CTL verb yep. noun specific thing. Delete and then this GUID. Yeah, just do, do the GUID. And I want to do both GUIDs. Oh, uh, no, PV, uh, yeah, you wanna make sure, delete PV space there, put the GUID. And you're gonna there wait, we go. wait a second and let that delete and you're gonna have to do that with the other one. Yeah, because otherwise you're gonna be reusing the same PVs. And if you try to do that after you delete um, a uh, namespace, then it's going to fail miserably. And I'm speaking from copious amounts of experience on that one. So and this is taking a yeah. fun amount of time here. Yeah, the, uh, there's another reason why. Have you ever used screen before? Yes. Okay, well, let's open up another SSH terminal and then we'll just launch from screen in there just in case we have to do anything. I guess we're in Windows here, but whatever. And let's see here, what was our IP James, address James, I agree here? that Tmux is easier, or sorry, is better. However, um, screen is close enough and tends to be installed and mostly available in more packages. So, but I always recommend new people learn Tmux over screen. Yes, but screen comes along for free in most places. And I remember, mm -hmm. The, the big uh, debate over uh, uh, whether or not uh, screen should be called GNU screen or not. Fair. Uh, dash, okay, or that. Uh, I usually do screen dash capital S and then the name of whatever screen session I wanna make it. So like, just call it demo. Okay, so now that screen is installed here, hey, we're working again. Okay, so while we were waiting, it should have finished. Or maybe it didn't finish. Uh, yeah, and I, 
Yeah, it's it, it will take a bit. Well. Okay, so we just come over here and and it delete. Was, uh, delete I got PV. It. Yep. And good. Yep. And then control A, control C for new uh, window while that's going on. And yep. now if you want to, you can change, tweak the name of the uh, PV a little bit in the Helm chart, but I don't know if that's going to have any cascading uh, residual effects. Yeah. Le... It looked like some of it was randomly generated which is good, but we'll find out. Yeah, uh, so we can, I guess, just plow ahead here. I mean, why not? It's live, right? What's the worst that can go on here? Oh, we already discovered what's, what the worst can happen. Uh, yeah, apparently you can't reuse name that's still in use. Hold on, that's the, uh, the config. So... So if you go into so that, we should, hmm. we should be able to do uh, Helm. Here they have their. We should just be able to do this, and it should. There we go. Okay, so now if we run this command, it should uh, tell us when the load balancer uh, Yeah, uh, you can use that and you can also check the pod status. Uh, do a control AC. And then it's the WordPress uh, namespace, correct? I believe so, yeah. Let's just do a get ns quick, just to make sure. It's not quite there. Control A, P, so let's go back a screen. Hmm, interesting. So we should see if the Helm install is working correctly. We should see the uh, namespace showing up yet uh, already. But it says- yeah, apparently. It's not playing nice with us here today. I did not sacrifice enough to the demo gods, apparently. Well, uh, I have a crazy idea. I I'm all ears. All right. So uh, do you have Discord open someplace not uh, easily available? Uh, easily visible, you mean? Well, just available. Because oh, uh, the alternative is I can get you on the mic cluster and you can try it on the first cluster. <laughs> that works. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing here? I'm assuming you're sending a uh, password or something. Eh, if not, I can I can delete it remotely or quickly afterwards. So give me a second. So users do a dash n dash g. And then I will get that cube config set up locally in their thing. So uh, no, you know what? Second thought, I don't support passwords on mine, only SSH keys and trying to get that live done never works out. So plan yeah, okay. B. So but okay, what's plan C? And you don't have oh, I do have a dumb idea. Can you just share your screen and run it from No, because I'm using my cell phone because oh. it won't work on my desktop, which oh, is the Lordy. whole reason why otherwise. But plan B or plan C, let me deploy one uh, in Linode for you, an entire cluster, and we'll just go from there. <laughs> oh, this is going to be one of those days. Oh, we're going to get it. So uh, I can't share my screen. Uh, easily, unless I have you SSH and then I share a terminal, and that's just going to be a mess. So screw it. Let's just get you a box going here. Uh, hey guys, and can, I ask a, can I ask a question real quick? Please, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. What's the screen sharing problem? Is it 
the lint, the new Linux client won't share a screen? Yeah, uh, apparently the the issue is uh, at least for me that my uh, local uh, install of Linux uh, of Linux is running uh, under Xorg, and it wants me to run Wayland instead. And I didn't find out about it until I hit share screen right as the meeting was starting. Uh, in, uh, in other words, in other words, we shouldn't update to the current Zoom client. Is that the idea? I, I, unless you uh, uh, have Wayland running on your local uh, machine, uh, if you're uh, running uh, Scent. I'm I running James. XFC. Go ahead. Who was that that um, wrote on the screen? Wasn't that James? He said he was running X. James, what version of, uh, I don't think he's around anymore, is he? Oh. Uh, no, looks like he is, uh, James. Hey there, so I did not update the Zoom client today. Well, there you go. I didn't have a choice, so. Anyway, I'm provisioning right now the uh, Linode um, stuff which means, uh, Andrew, these are Arch Linux boxes and we can both uh, connect at the same time. So we'll, we'll get you an IP address and a password. And if everyone really wishes to, uh, we can all hop on as the same uh, user and use a screen session. Um, please do not jack up my Linode build too much, but let's, we'll have some fun. Yeah, Wheaton's law definitely applies at this point. All right, so I created that. I'm waiting for the Wheaton's law is, please. So Wheaton's law is don't be a dick. Okay, so Ansible. Let's go. So by the way, if anyone's interested in what I'm doing right now, I am right now in the gitlab.com slash buzzcrate slash uh, config buzz project. And I'm actually using the Terraform from there to install the get Linode uh, um, command that I have in the uh, Linode CLI folder. And then in the Ansible web scale um, folder, I'll be running the K3's installer. <clears throat> Once that's ready and when that's installing, all right, cool. That's done, Terraform's done running. Uh, get an uh, SSH window open up, Andrew. Okay. And I will get go. you the IP addresses. So, source bin inactivate, Linode CLI, and it's going to be Linode's list. Using the command prompt to get that, and I got to make my screen a little bigger so I can read it. Okay. So, the IP address that you're going to want. So, it's going to be uh, the user is going to be Cooper. So, SSH Cooper. K U B E R. Okay. And it's going to be IP address 45.33.87.158. Okay. And then the password is buzzword bingo, all lowercase, no spaces. And let me make this a little bigger, and I will start the screen session. So I can just have you piggyback off of mine and we can share my screen through your terminal because we're okay. going to be crazy like that. So let's go B-U-Z-W-O-R-D. B-U-Z-Z. B-U-Z-Z-W-O-R-D. No, no, no. Buzzword bingo. Oh, uh, yeah. B U Z Z W O R D B I N G O. Hmm. I'll type it out so you can copy and paste it. And everyone else can follow along. And I will double check the IP and I'll paste the IP address. Oh, great. This is going to be fun. <clears throat> All right. Going over to the chat and. Yep, I'm waiting in the, the chat here. Or are you talking about in? Uh...
Sorry about this, guys. It's bad when we have to resort to cell phones. All right, and chat. So it's going to be, uh, so IP address is 45. 33.87.158. That is correct. I'm on it right now. And then the password is, uh, so username is Cooper. K-U-B-E-R. Yep, and then that's the password. And when you get in, okay. just do a screen dash R and it's up and running, so. Uh, kubectl command. Okay, what am I doing around here? It is not letting me in. Interestingly, it won't let me back in when I do a um, pseudo. Or sorry, it won't let me do a pseudo. Did so? Did someone decide to change my password via Dick? It it doesn't let me in either. I I just tried to. Interesting. Okay, let me try something quick. Um. All right, let's try to go back up in there. Huh. Yeah, I got locked out, so someone changed my password. That is cool. Nice, guys. No worries. I got this. So we're going to do a... TF destroy. All right, we'll just launch another one. No big deal. Um, Andrew, on your I'm screen, going I to go ahead and stop sharing here, and you can send me a private uh, message of the IP address. Yeah, I'll send it to you over Discord, and we'll go from there. I don't know if anyone actually did that or it was just because we're sure I, I don't even care at this point. It doesn't matter. All right, so let's see here. So it's still destroying once it's going to rebuild the new stuff. All right, there's that. Uh, we'll get you in right away as soon as it uh, provisions the new system. And I got your pong. Good, good, good. So while we're waiting, anyone working on any fun projects? Uh, I accidentally display are going to be displacing about four people with their full time job of doing um, internal tooling, where I turned a basic CRUD app in Flask, so it's a multi purpose um, self service portal, and connects to GitLab for running pipelines with full-on authentication that our security team can approve, disapprove, that kind of stuff. Um, so, and I did that drunkenly in about two months. So, yeah. Oh, and I have a Kubernetes cluster launch it for its K3s to host it in the pipelines with the GitLab runner. Well, now my project sounds a whole lot less impressive. Yeah, mine was just a rehash of stuff I've already did. So really it was more like a copy and paste job as from me this summer. So what did you do that's clearly more effort than I did? <laughs> I am 3D printing my own little volume knob to sit on my desk and actually, um, you know, control music volume. 
I found a previous project and example code, and the only problem was that the example code didn't work. Well, that's still pretty cool. Um, so this volume knob, is there, uh, what sample code is, are you running from? Like, is it using like Lufa stack on an Arduino or off of an Atmel processor for some uh, device or what? Yeah, so I'm uh, using a Teensy and I found it was actually like a Prusa uh, 3D printer example project for a regular Arduino and the library they were using did not like the Teensies. Uh, that can happen sometimes with pinouts and stuff. Makes sense. Well, I mean, the nice part is, is that if you get uh, some of the, the nice Arduino knockoffs, you can solder one in for the size of a Teensy, then not have a problem. Oh, no, I, I found the library that did the thing. It was oh, just nice. figuring out what, what libraries would work was the annoying part. So the, the fun I have, it, it's, I, I'm not the one who is uh, directly involved in it, but uh, my uh, employer now apparently has a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation to do uh, COVID testing at scale. And by scale, I mean, uh, I think they're shooting for like in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands per what time unit? Uh, day. That's pretty awesome. That is a scale. Yeah. Yeah, apparently they're... Uh, going to be uh, just doing it in, in bulk uh, and should be pretty impressive once they, they get it all working. Uh, so one moment here and we'll be in. Hey, I'm in. Uh, so uh, screen. Let me, yeah, let me uh, get, it, it's not gonna have, um, I'll get the screen session going. Let me get the, uh, the, the K3s install going, which okay. should take about 30 seconds on there, so. If you LS, we can share your screen now. Um, if you. Yep. Give me one second to get back out of. Yeah. There we go. And. Oh. And sure. Unreachable. Oh, right, hold on. I, I did. I made a mistake. Give me a second. I forgot to update my Ansible, uh, my Ansible inventory. Now it's working. So now there should be a K3s folder, and I will be right in. And hopefully that text is big enough for everyone there. Yep. Yep. Far so good. Yes. Thank you for my eyes. I do what I can. You just need a 4K monitor. Yeah, unfortunately, I bought this large monitor and then I discovered it wasn't 4K. But it is Ooh, a 49-inch ultra wide screen. So yeah, I'd gotten a couple of new monitors at work right before we got sent home. Pixels so, per inch is everything. I wouldn't say everything, but uh, I can say you miss it when it's gone. You, don't so, go up in that. Only go down. Or, yeah, so I have card, a... Well, what are you driving it with for a video card? Andrew? Uh, so this is just a standard... Uh, uh, not 4K. Uh, th this is just uh, standard 1080p and uh, mystery meat, whatever came on the motherboard uh, GPU. Uh, type, yeah, you can type screen dash R now. Okay. Uh, let's see, screen is on, it, it's attached. There is no screen to be resumed. What was the command to attach to a existing? Oh, sorry. Uh, use dash X. There we go. Let's see if I can make that a little bigger. All right, there we go. Anyway, so we'll deal with what we got here. Um, so uh, I guess I have one last thing I need to do, which is sudo kubectl get your uh, helm install stuff your notes ready cool and 
and this is not the best way to do this, but I was doing something else. Okay. okay. And then chat. I just pasted into uh, chat the uh, the Helm uh, command. Okay. Uh, yeah, you paste it to the um, where my phone goes. So, uh, oh. but no, it's okay. And let's get, get notes here. Cool. We're ready to rock. So do your thing. Okay. So I should be able to go like that. Okay. And your helm should be installed there. So yep. to verify it, uh, let's see, there was the what to do next here. Oh, I guess it's in the quick start. So we should be able to see no repositories configured. Okay, so first we have to add in a repo. And actually we'll probably want to do the uh, the uh, WordPress one, so the Bitnami one. And then. Andrew, this is Ed. Did you mean yes. by repo uh, a Docker repo? No, it's uh, so a Helm repo. It's a Helm repo. Th think of it as like a meta uh, repo that uh, contains uh, Helm. Uh, charts for deployment into a uh, Kubernetes cluster. Inside that Helm uh, chart is the Docker images uh, links that you need to worry about. Okay, so, so where is that hosted at? So that, that's hosted at this charts.bitnami.com slash bitnami. And you can also get to it if you go into uh, the uh, Helm uh, website. Uh, there's a uh, spot to search for uh, charts. So it takes you to artifacthub.io. So if we search for WordPress, the, the first one that comes up is the Bitnami one. And uh, here's the, the same instructions that we were operating off of before. So now uh, we've deployed it. We should be able to watch the, the status here. I'm sorry if I missed this. What is a chart? So a chart is a bundle of information necessary to create a Kubernetes app. So if we take a look at just uh, this demo one here, uh, let's see, they should have their GitHub repo here. There it is. Or that's not the right one. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, Andrew, on yes. your command prompt, do me a favor and hit Control A N. Go to the next window. I installed a little tool called K9s, so it's a terminal user interface. There we go. So you can actually go up, down, you can figure out, uh, you can actually get a status of it. We can look at all the namespaces here. So 
so we don't see the namespace in here, but we can look at all the deployments. And the reason why we didn't see the deployment before is because it was in a different namespace. Apparently they threw it in the default namespace. So that could have been something going on with your local cluster that was different. And then we can go to pods and it looks like it's still grabbing information over there. On your side, if we do a control A N, so go back to the other. All right. So over here, we can do something else here where we can do a cube CTL get events dash n default dash w. So it will just update with the latest stuff. So we can actually see the current events, what's happening for each one. So as you can see, it says successfully pulled and still having an issue. Readiness probe is failing for that particular connection. Interesting. And I don't know if Didn't that's because they have Anyway, though, in theory, you're you're supposed to be able to deploy this. Uh, you can also create a your own custom uh, uh, Helm uh, chart uh, and the directions for it. Is just uh, Helm create and the name of the the chart that you want to create so here while we're waiting if we went so now if we look there's a folder named foo and in there is a uh, yaml uh, file so if we go Uh, here we have just a very basic uh, file here saying it's a application and it's what version it is. Uh, if we look at uh, values, here we can see that this is where all the, uh, let's see here. Uh, so we're asking for one copy of it. The image that we're deploying is Nginx and uh, not really doing much that's uh, overly fancy here, setting it to be cluster IP uh, so that if I remember right, that it's available only inside of the cluster itself and yes. uh, on port 80. So this isn't publicly accessible. You'd want to have some sort of reverse proxy in front of it to be able to uh, get it out to the world or you'd tweak the settings there, but also you can set up the, uh, so that it gets a uh, SSH and your ingress uh, path and all that stuff to be able to expose it out to the world. Here's what its uh, host name is. And then also you can limit how, how much CPU it has, how much memory, et cetera, to make sure that you don't uh, have it run away from you. You can set up auto scaling. So if it has lots of uh, traffic hitting it, it will spin out to a hundred more uh, uh, instances of itself. And uh, basically that can be driven off of CPU or memory usage or whatever. And then once you have that built out, the next thing that you want to run after that is, uh, let's see here, it was in the, uh, da, 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 da. so the, the, sorry, I'm, uh, all of my notes were on the other machine here, but then to, to build it, uh, Pulling a blank here, they they had it. Here we 
go. So first you generate it. Uh, here's that, uh, all of the documents, I'll, I'll include this in the, uh, the uh, PDF that I send out later. But then after you've created up your uh, service, you can uh, check to see how it runs, but there, there should be like a, install I was pretty sure there was like a build in between that but uh, home install and then foo and then you do And this will make, force it to be uh, exposed externally so it will be visible to the world. Set. I'm working on getting that exposed stuff with the uh, load balancer stuff built for um, Linode right now. So I'm doing that in another okay. window because I'm literally going doing this on the fly just like you are. Yeah, so anyway though, uh, so we should be deploying that. So if we run this stack of commands, it should give us So if we go to this uh, URL here, we should get something, I'm hoping. And hey, uh, we're uh, now able to talk to this uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, Helm chart that we uh, just created. So, All right, and I'm going to go back to the Linode cluster. I'm working on releasing right now the, uh, if we do everything, I'm working on getting the uh, Kubernetes um, load balancer stuff out. Okay, uh, is that in screen here or? Uh, if you, yeah, if you do a control A and there we go. So I'm working on trying to get this out right now. So there's a load balancer thing. Um, Oh, so traffic is exposing it for port 80 right now. So, okay, well then never mind. I guess we're seeing a slight conflict on node ports. So, question on your Helm chart, can we change a port number and see what happens? Oh, or it's a service, right? So, yeah. But, all right, so if you do an E on this, I think, what's the edit? So E. Nope, it's not letting me go, and I don't know if it's because of screen or what, but. Yeah, it, it's saying some sort of error there. All right, well, let's, I'm going to go into another window. So it's going to be called my WordPress release, or my release WordPress. I'm going to copy that. Uh, do a control A and kubectl edit uh, service that just to make safe side unable to launch vi oh sudo young uh sorry sudo and we're going to install vim hopefully that will work wrong password oh it should be there do I have to install VI? Oh, you bastard. Okay. The other trick is to switch it all over to Vim. All right. So in here, if we wanted to, oh, 
Oh. Whoa. All right. So to so, answer your question, that's the the helm chart that uh, we we were pulling down just uh, without. I edited it. the service file. So the helm chart applies all the deployments, like your service, that kind of stuff. Like we can actually, if we want to, do a describe and see everything that's kind of going on. Um, you can also do an export on this, where if you want over here, we can do like a cube CPL. Um, and actually, if we just change this from edit to get dash o yaml, and we'll just call this svc.yaml. Uh, oh, whoops. So you can actually take these files and reapply them. A lot of this stuff is like right in this section is all like the annotation section, anything with this F stuff in front of it can just go ahead and delete. And then the rest of it, um, it doesn't have that notation. Really, you just need everything below the spec file part is what you edit. But this is the actual uh, files that Helm takes this information, turns what a chart does is it takes metadata information from the user, puts it in these uh, deployment files, and then adds those deployment files to Kubernetes. And they have a way of, you know, making it so if you have multi-agent nodes, whatever, you know, make sure it's not battling different ports. That's what we were dealing with here. And by the way, if we do a, uh, let's get out of here. Um, if we do a cube CTL, get SVC dash N for the namespace of default. So now, if we go to that IP address uh, on your page and go to port 8080, I think that should do the trick. Yep. And that's using the load balancer, which there's, it's called the Linode CCM. Um, that's actually exposed through the Linode load balancer. So you can actually do whatever you want on Kubernetes and I'll actually set it up. So it doesn't matter what node it is, that know all the Kubernetes stuff will work with Linode with their load balancer to share it with the world. Well, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So now you're actually set up. So uh, add a certificate and voila, you're ready to rock and roll with production. And they do have a similar service built in with Amazon. Amazon services are a little bit more complicated than what they've done for deployment with Kubernetes with Linode. But it's, a, it's basically look at what a node load balancer is, an application load balancer, and there's ways to tie in a service, a uh, load balance, regular load balancer with that in Amazon for your own deployed you know, cluster. It's even easier when you use EKS for exposure, exposure, but just know that whenever you pay for managed services in AWS, especially for playing around and trying to figure out what Kubernetes is, it does get a little bit more annoying, but and a little expensive, but. Yeah. Whereas this uh, is going to cost me a whopping dollar if I forget to shut it off tonight. Yeah, uh, but sort of the the end story in all of this is that, as you can see, it is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more heartburn than just your uh, Docker Compose file. But it, it is also, in theory, you, you write this once, you uh, get it working and then you can deploy it wherever you want to, whether it be your local machine for dev work or uh, into a cluster. Can Helm import that YAML file that we generated um, uh, into like a chart, like separate files? So a chart basically maps user input data into the deployment files to then go talk Kubernetes native uh, speak. So it's like a meta, it's like an extra layer of abstraction of your information into those YAML files for Kubernetes configurations to deploy to Kubernetes, which is what it uses. Now, the problem is with changing it like I did after the Helm deployment means that I need to go back and update my charts. So, uh, Andrew, do you know where your Helm chart is located that we can go to poke around? Uh, yeah, it's in Foo right there. And it's going to be chart.yaml? Yeah. No, let's look at values. 
Yeah, values is what really matters. Yeah. So the equivalent of what I did is, uh, so there's a cluster IP. We don't want cluster IP for that. We want. Well, so I, I brute forced it over to be uh, the the other. Basically, I did a dot a dash uh, double dash add uh, at command line. So it. Oh, uh, gotcha. So I sort of cheated. Okay. But yeah. Um, so this is just all high level stuff. But let's say we wanted to look at the raw deployments. I mean, if you want to. And so, well, if we have foo, we must make a bar, right? All right, so let's go into bar. So let's start grabbing stuff here. So if you wanted to, you can do a, let's do a cube CTL get deployments. All right, cool. So the idea is that we can do dash O. Now they used to have an export command to make things a little nicer. And they also support JSON for this too, if you're really curious. So we're gonna do my and but yeah, you can just go through one by one and start grabbing these and create your own deployments. And if you do the deployments right in series um you should get what you're looking for in terms of the raw deployment files for kubernetes um instead of relying on the helm file so you just grab that file and you can apply that as well so and the fun thing with k3s is there's actually a folder that you can drop those into and then it will just auto deploy on uh startup basically mm -hmm. and then to apply any of these just do qctl dash f um, and it will update uh, any of those. Now you may have to grab a latest one if there's some changes, because uh, if there, if you must do know how to remove the annotations, but that's just about it. Uh, let me grab this, and we'll go look at those side by side. All right, so let's go vim foo and. All right, cool. And so basically, here's the deployment if you wanted to, to look at. Oh yeah, that is definitely very complicated. So over a hundred lines of deployment code and is what you're looking at. So there's the Helm chart in here. Also, the nice thing is that when you use a Helm chart, it'll actually mark state. So if you make a change to the Helm chart and ready to redeploy it, it'll actually make some of those changes on the uh, actual system. And one of the things that I saw up there, uh, the basically the idea is that if you have multiple uh, uh, redundant uh, images here, uh, you can actually do rolling updates. So like it will only roll, uh, only change 25% uh, at a time. Mm -hmm. So like say if you have a hundred uh, uh, instances all providing uh, your service out to the world, it'll only update 25 at a time, then the next 25 and et cetera, until you get to hundred percent. Right. and I can. Uh, you can also do stuff with Kubernetes, or they call them canary deployments as well. Um, so you can actually set that up for putting out some pods that are with and without it, and you can start tracking it for some issues. Um, so if you have an update to a container or you're like testing it and it's production-ish ready, um, or what some people also do it is do use it for use case testing, which is what they, if you ever want to know what Amazon really does is they do a lot of productions directly to production ish um so they have kind of like a prod canary test where you're getting beta tested on constantly as random super, uh, user sample for different features and they work on getting usability matrix on that and then if they like what they what they're seeing and there's no errors and that kind of stuff then they'll push it to the main branch for general acceptance and then that'll go cascading out across kubernetes across uh, all the other user experiences for like the aws console uh, Amazon shopping, um, that kind of stuff. And they're not the only industry to do it. They're just the most vocal about how awesome you can do it using their tools, obviously. So, um, yeah. 
but that definitely goes way beyond the so you're a uh, idiot uh, user like me uh, level. Oh, Kubernetes makes us all look like idiots, so don't don't worry. You're just going to go up to a higher level of idiot. <laughs> all right. Um. So let me see if let's go take a look at that chart a little bit more in Foo. Uh. Then chart.yaml. So they just go in the application, all right? Yeah, this was just the Hello World uh, template. Yep. So in this folder is where you're going to see like the raw um, example charts, like for instance, for the service. Uh, Service.yaml, there we go. So this is showing exactly what we're looking at. And then if you see, it's using like a Jinja 2 style um type of uh markup language with it or like we are like meta uh replacement so your chart information is matched up with these variables so this is what's going to get written in there except for the foo dot labels when you use that it's actually going to go for the foo variable or uh, sorry the foo object and find the labels member variable for it and then pop it right in there as if it's all one string So this way with the Helm chart, you can do a bunch of different things and have all of them run in parallel and you're just running it from the command line. That's all that Helm is doing also with a package manager so you can update it. So it's like app get for Kubernetes. And I still can't find the port that it came in on, jeez. So in this demo, I mean, excuse my ignorance, but you only uh, view the cluster with like one node, essentially, is that what you did? Yes, uh, so the idea behind this is that you just have your one local uh, cluster of one. So it, it, but it becomes fairly trivial from there if you wanted to add additional nodes, especially using uh, K3S. Uh, the, the command is, uh, so if we go to uh, they actually have in their documentation. I believe at the very bottom, they'll show you at that screen if you wanted to add another node. Ah, yeah, here it is. Uh, so you basically just uh, follow this set of directions here. So you run, uh, See if I can make that a little bit bigger for people. Uh, this uh, K3S servers ampersand, and then it will write out this uh, information here. And then you run uh, that git node. And then on that machine that you want to join to the, uh, the cluster, you get your node token from this file right here. And then back on the, that first server, you just run that command and it just will join the cluster. So the server you run on the controller node, all the workers you run like the very last line. And the, and the, the first one you create is gonna be the server, I guess, right? Like to create the yes. cluster. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, just let you know, traditionally in Kubernetes for like most deployments, they don't want anything running on the master. Um, when you launch the server with that specific command, the master or controller node is also a compute node. So it's doing scheduling and that kind of stuff. So in terms of scaling out, if you're building a cluster, so locally, and I recommend using kubectl, a one node kubectl, or, or sorry, one node K3's cluster is better than um, Minikube and Hypercube. Um, you can use it, but do one, one, one node cluster and then add other nodes to the master. And then if you want to, you can uh, change how you start up that, uh, that K3's server. So you don't have compute with one of the switch statements. There's a help document for it. And then you can just have the worker nodes. And then you, after you've exhausted a K3's cluster with one master node and a bunch of others, you can even scale up to multiple master nodes in etcd, which gets a little bit more complicated. But after you've exhausted everything with K3s, then it's time to go on to 
RKE, OpenShift, uh, a direct Kubernetes, like, you know, bare metal installation. There's a bunch of options for Kubernetes installations, and that's where a discussion happens after that. But K3s will scale up for most people as far as you want to go. And then the key thing about using K3s versus something else is also it's very ephemeral. There's a lot of leftover stuff with other distros um, and even Minikube. K3s, as long as you know where to delete one of the files in slash var, you're, you're golden. And the thing is, once you've grown beyond the point that uh, K3s uh, won't actually work for you anymore, uh, you're, you're probably going to be not nearly as much of a noob anymore at it. Yeah, it, it's really good for getting adoption and testing. Oh, and the best part about it is uh, actually setting up Kubernetes clusters inside your deployment pipelines for your testing branches. So you can actually de deploy a ephemeral Kubernetes cluster, test all your stuff out in a Kubernetes cluster, and then completely destroy everything when you're done with it. A little Inception-esque there, but hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, yeah it did, absolutely. And uh, again, excuse my ignorance, but uh, you know, like in this demo, we deployed the, the WordPress on the single node cluster that we built. Uh, yep. Let's assume that we wanted to add like two or three nodes to this cluster. And we want to move the WordPress cluster from the center node or the server node. We'll do that right now. So my Terraform that I've written uh, for the Buzzcrate project allows me to scale up. So um, I'm going to add four more nodes because I want to one up your request. And I can't share my screen, otherwise I would. But here, so I have two worker nodes right now. I'm going to make that six in my Terraform. I'm going to do a Terraform apply. And while it's working in the background, um, And will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, really, the one of the beauties of uh, Kubernetes is that you don't necessarily really have to care which node it's working on. It just works. Yes, and when you're using an external load balancer, like I set up for you behind the scenes, um, your cloud provider, or uh, if you're on prem, use Metal LB. Um, well, where you can set IP ranges and that kind of stuff if you're in a data center. But you can set it up so that an external uh, provider, when you go to expose any of those ports, the provider uh, will give you a static IP or static entry and manage that for you and work with Kubernetes. So as things bounce around to different nodes, the cloud, uh, your cloud provider or your load balance, your metal LB load balancer will make sure that it's one IP coming in. So you do have some type of load balancing into the cluster. So it will do some, but I still recommend if you're looking at hard traffic, um, an F5 server or an Nginx or Apache or HA proxy, whatever, put that in front of your known points where you want it to come into your network in a production environment. Do your terminations there. And then everything uh, on the other side of those hardware load balancers you're having in will be uh, unencrypted. Um, For the sake of performance, a lot, only a few uh, network internal software networking stuff inside of Kubernetes will do, um, will do uh, terminate or will use uh, SSL certs for networking. Um, the main reason why is that the, the performance hit for internal networking with a cert is so high that unless you're considering going across, across cloud vendors or something, or you know just open across the internet from one node to another, which I really don't recommend, that's the only time you would use that type of networking. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're using something like flannel for your, your network uh, uh, plane inside the cluster, uh, everything's all encrypted anyway. Uh, no, inside the plane it is not. Or, well, from, from looking outside, basically. Uh, no, it's, it's definitely open. There's a lot oh. of, it looks like gibberish, but it is not really encrypted because that in extra encryption on it is just, um, I mean, you're not, you're not going to be able to, let's say, do a Wireshark and pull data on it easily, 
but if you're listening and you understand how those virtual networking services work or the software defined networking services work, yeah, you can clear it, you can pull it out. That's not good. Well, it's there depending for on, reasons. Yeah. Yeah, depending on how much you trust your uh, network. Yeah, just make it so the only ports people see are the only ones you give and expose and terminate your search there and just leave that as a barrier. That's all I can recommend. All right, so I'm going to do a cube CTL apply and see if that's done with the, yep. All right, so I'm going to update my uh, get Linodes and I'm updating my K3s here or running that again. So that'll run and just skip over current systems already have it. And we can watch over here, cube CTL or actually let's do K9s. And so for a bit of the, the info of what uh, Will's doing, uh, there's a previous talk that he presented on uh, about Ansible from a few months ago. I, I forget when it exactly happened. This COVID time is weird time. All right, wait for it. It's coming in. Three, two, one. We should start seeing them register any second now. There we go. They're popping in. OK, is that on a separate uh, uh, screen? Uh, go to the K9s. Go to the, oh, yeah, or if you run the command again, just press up. Oh, uh, yeah, we're not seeing it on your shared screen for some odd reason. Yeah, no. And not. <laughs> All right, do this. Hit Control A, or sorry, hit Control Q, Shift Q. There we go. Now you're back there. I was watching you press stuff. It happens every now and then. I do not know why. Anyway, so if I go to nodes, yeah, we're up and running. We have all new nodes ready to rock and roll. And because these are like uh, defined as like worker nodes, is is K3 is smart enough to move the deployment to them? Yes. Like the, 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 okay, good. good. Oh, yeah. So here, um, let me show you. So this is one thing I love about K9s. So let's go into this WordPress release and let's say we want to scale it. So I just simply press uh, S for scale. Let's move to five, to, uh, five replicas. And over here, I go to pods, come on. There we go. It's going to say running, and it's actually installing those pods in the background right now on the system. So let's actually go to just default. And there we go. So it's actually scaling up. And you can see on the right-hand side what node is it going to be attached to with where and blah, blah, blah. And because I feel like having some fun, we're going to go watch what happens when we add some more. Um, Got dash F some more apps just because we can. And if we go to actually just go to show all pods. There we go. And so we're, I'm, inst I'm installing Go Echo right now and go back. Where's the book demo at? And uh, these applications I'm talking about for the Go Echo book demo are, are also in the Buzzcrate project. Um, and I have pipelines for how they're built and turned into containers and I'm doing multi-arch builds between x86 and ARM on my own personal hardware with GitLab, so you can get an introduction to all of that. And we're going for the whole thing. Cube CTL, apply dash F, Flask deployment. So that should start working. And then I'll get the service in. And so you can see up here, we have new pods coming in for my Flask service thing. 
but so the the biggest point here is that we don't worry about where it's running it, it's just magic handled on the the cluster and in theory uh you can add more nodes you can take nodes away and uh, life is good mm -hmm. with a little bit of hand waving there in mm -hmm. the fact that if uh whatever you're running on that node when it dies it will spin up a new one but unless you're checkpointing stuff any sort of work that you were doing there get started over again basically and you know i guess you need to work on the persistent storage part if you have a database or something i'm assuming right so it, yes. it has persistent uh, storage there but I, i'm talking about like say if you were calculating out the digits of the pi or something and for performance reasons you weren't writing it to disk uh if that node goes down, you'd lose anything that you uh, were working on that hadn't been written to disk. So if and you're even then, storing it, yeah, the stock um, uh, persistent volume storage is they pretty much just randomly elect one node when you go out do a persistent volume call and just writes locally there. Uh, but you, they do have support for NFS. If you're looking for high performance storage. That is a very long and complicated discussion about Kubernetes as, as a whole, which I think you're getting here, you're hinting at, um, as well as databases, where you would, it's better to have a bare metal off cluster appliance handling some of the storage and um, uh, database stuff for you yeah. if you need a lot of throughput. I was just like, you know, like being a very stupid person too. I, I was just wondering about like in your WordPress deployment, for example, um, if you enter some blog entries, where do they get stored? And like, how do we know that it's not going to be destroyed with the nodes? Like when they dis are destroyed, I guess, you know, does that make sense? Well, let's go take a yeah. look. Uh, let's go look at the namespace. And in the namespace, we have default in here. We're going to type in PVC. So we're in the namespace. So there are two um, persistent volume claims created. So there's a MariaDB and there's a WordPress uh, uh, thing as well. So let's go to deployments first. And let me scale back from five to one. And then in there, let's go to the pod and figure out which one of the release ones are gonna stay. It's gonna be this one. So I can actually grab the shell in here and I don't know where it mounts, but we can access the entire pod in here. And one of, container. Yeah, one of the ways that you can uh, store stuff, you, you can like back it to S3 or uh, potential uh, spots like that for long-term potential or long-term uh, storage. Sure. Performance, you're going to take a hit from the fact that it's an S3, but. Can you do like scheduled uh, like backups or something, perhaps? I don't know. Like, you know, you, you, you wouldn't normally. I, I'm just approaching from a practical standpoint. If you have a, like a blog site like that, I assume that you want to keep them, right? I mean, yes. Not, not on a like a every single second kind of like a, a you know, basis, but maybe you know, from those defined persistent storages, I think you can download and backup them on a weekly basis perhaps or something, right? I mean, you know, those are findable resources. Yes. Yeah. So there, there are a couple different ways inside of WordPress itself. You can actually just do a flat out export of your, your blog. If you want to go for the, the naive, um, stupid hosting route, or uh, I'm sure, Will, there's uh, a magical way of uh, getting a, at your persistent storage and uh, copying it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's always a way to do that. Um, you can always mount uh, the storage locally. Um, I know for a fact we can go poking around and see what we can find. Um, I don't know on what system they'll be on, so we have to figure out what node it's tied to, but... Sure. Yeah, if you go to the node, you can actually find out where it's actually stored on it, actually what disk on what node. That's not terribly difficult. Actually, let's get some more information on that. If we go over to PVC and actually want to go to PV, 
And the one we're looking for here is, let's say my release WordPress in here. Um, so if I do a describe, I can find out interesting. So here's the PVC name of it. And I don't know where the node is. Oh, so it's on worker zero and it's in the standard uh, namespace thing. So, oh, and here's the path for it. So here's the actual yep. uh, um, path and the node that it's associated with. That seems good enough, honestly. Yeah, okay. another option that you could have would be, I believe you can uh, run a sidecar that uh, image that basically you'd slide alongside there and you'd have access to that uh, uh, path. And then you could uh, copy it out to like say an NFS mount or something like that. Yeah. Or maybe even basic sync sync or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, the fun thing about this is, let's say, uh, let's go for the WordPress. Let's be two for default. All right, so two. And let's say, so this is on worker zero right now. Let's say, oh no, something happened to it and it deleted. So it's actually going to go fire up. It's, oh, this one's sticking to worker zero. Is there affinity to this? Hmm. If there is affinity, nope. Oh. I think it was just lucky. <laughs> and it's still out. So obviously you can tell this is uh, another sacrifice to the demo gods because Oh, it's not even coming up online. This is interesting. Well, I may have broken that. In theory, in a perfect world, uh, once you uh, clobber it, it's supposed to spin up a new one uh, automatically and start it back running again. Unfortunately, tonight <laughs> is not our night. <laughs> Holy All right, cow. So, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I actually wrote this. It's simple enough. So let's, uh, let's do a control delete on this. And this one should come down. All right, so this one's going to spin up on five. While that's going, let's go get the IP address information for it. So once it gets the external, oh, did I apply the wrong one? Let's go down here. Nope. Ah, yeah, I did. Whoopsie. All right. So now we're going to get an external IP. <laughs> and now we're ready to go. All right. It has so been now, one of those days. Oh, but this has been a blast. I really appreciate it. So long as we have uh, still a few people on the line, uh, we don't have a presentation for next month yet. Uh, if uh, people have something they'd like to talk about and or present about, uh, the, the world is your oyster and this is your chance to talk to a room that's obviously friendly enough to uh, tolerate failure. No, science, experimentation. All right, so if you go to port 81 and then you just type in, you know, hello CIA lug on that, uh, if you want to post that. Um, yeah, so we're looking at... 172, 172.104.17. Uh, Dot 143. And then, yep, and then port 81. Okay, and then just at go. the end of that slash, you put a slash and then just type anything. You can put spaces in, whatever. And then there's Golang running on the cluster. Hooray. God, I don't know how many characters I can support, so more science here. Bump the font a couple times, would you please? Just press enter, press enter. And then we'll add some. Oh, I did it. So uh, basically, it's just the URL here, uh, or the, the IP address of the load balancer, and then just a long string of junk. And it just echoes it back to you. And if I go, there's another one here. We can go check out here from scratch. And if I go to SVC here, 
Uh, oh, that's, I don't want Scratch. I want to go to NS, I want to go to CRUD. If you go to port, so if we go to this IP here, one uh, four five dot seven nine dot one twenty eight dot one fourteen, and then port six five 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 There we go. It always does that. Just go up to the address and press enter again. The reason why is it's a database thing is getting out of hand and I never figured out how to handle that, but yeah. So there we go. We have two, we have three apps. Well, we had three apps before I completely nuked one of them. Um, I don't know if it ever came back. It looks like it's actually back up and running. So let's go to back to the WordPress. Um, let me pull up that information quick. SPC and I want default, which is three. So uh, so yeah, if you go to 45791281214 and port 8080, we should be able to ready to, or we should be looking good. There it is back running again. Apparently it just took a little while for it to uh, spin up. Yep. Awesome. So it's fault tolerant to a point. It, apparently we, we pushed to the max on how tolerant it could be. So uh, we've gone way past what I had planned on presenting on, but uh, th that's perfectly okay. Uh, the, the good news is we don't have anyone to uh, kick us out here. And uh, this is a point that if we were normally meeting in person, we'd go uh, grab a slice of pizza and a uh, carbonated beverage of one sort or another. But uh, I mean, people are more than welcome to continue to hang out and do uh, general nerdery in our uh, nice uh, Kubernetes cluster that uh, will spun up for us. Thank you, Will. No problem. I'm glad it actually came to use for once other than just a demo that I was doing. That, that was fun. Thank you so much for doing it both. Yeah, and there, there is definitely a lot more. I mean, we're just skating the, the tip of the iceberg here for the the amount of uh, bad things you can do inside of Kubernetes. But man, is it fun. I'd like to add two comments first off to Hakan. You're apologizing for asking questions. Don't apologize because you are asking them more quickly than I could formulate them and ask them. And I needed to ask answer the same questions and more. So thank and you, Hakan. Good questions. <laughs> yes, so they, they were definitely very good and I mean, I, I have to admit, I am very much a noob in this space as well. I, I'm pretty okay-ish in uh, Docker Compose, but this, this was definitely pushing the edges of my uh, wheelhouse to and, uh, play with the Kubernetes uh, uh, stirring uh, sort of uh, jokes. And also your question about the persistent volume thing, I hadn't even thought about that in years. So thank you, forced me to think on my feet. I'm glad that I got the answer for you. Glad to be of help. <laughs> no problem. It's also really fun when you go to your uh, Kubernetes cluster admin and say, hey, I, I need a few terabytes of uh, scratch space. Can, can you give it to me uh, by tomorrow? Um, yeah, you're an evil person if that was actually you asking that. Uh, it was actually, but it, thankfully it wasn't by tomorrow. It was more a, hey, this is a use case you haven't thought about yet. Uh, if we're going to be replacing uh, HPC usage with uh, just running it inside of Kubernetes, these are the sort of questions that I deal with on a daily basis. Can we do this? Uh, that, that's very fair. Um, I can see that if you're trying to use Kubernetes in, a, in an HPC space, 
you were in a in, in a edge of edge con, uh, condition. Oh, so totally. And uh, to to be fair, uh, really calling it HPC, that that was somewhat of a uh, hand waving because it was uh, I only needed just one big hunk of memory and one process to run against it, but a Docker uh, image uh, to run basically a Docker image to run some uh, processing of data. So it's running an AWS batch right now, just perfectly happy as a clam. As it should be. Are there any other questions at all? Comments? Yeah, Things people about, want to see? Uh, how about a higher level question? <clears throat> my, my concept of clusters and, you know, basically kind of like Docker Compose on steroids, you might have 40 or 50 different functions supporting a, a huge application. But what about a simpler scenario? How adaptable would this be to running 50 WordPress sites on the, on the same cluster? I mean, is that something that's philosophically compatible? It is completely doable, especially if you have an endpoint outside the cluster that, uh, or if you have like an external load balancer that it's supposed to manage. Ideally, you want to have like one load balancer set up per um, WordPress site. And then the rest of it. Uh, so what you're seeing uh, over on Andrew's screen when I do a namespace, ideally, if you want to set up a giant cluster that's supposed to be up all the time, I don't care if it's in the data center, I don't care if it's in the cloud, where it doesn't matter. But if you have a project team, the idea is that you can actually set up what they call rule-based access controls. And your Kubernetes administrator can create a namespace and create users and tie users uh, with a cascading effect of how much resources of the cluster um, each namespace should get within that namespace. What is the maximum amount of resources a user may use? And that could be RAM and that could be uh, processors. And when I say processors and compute, it's actually using fractions of a core, like compute time with it. So you get really fine grain uh, control. Um, storage is the same thing. Uh, networking IP addresses for being exposed. Uh, you can tie people to all sorts of things. On top of that too, with the nodes, you can go really nuts with the nodes. So let's say you have a blockchain. It could be for tracking purchases, or like some payment systems. It could be handling um, you know, specific user data that you wanna have tied and associated or some type of like resource management. So in tracking in like a manufacturing sense, um, you can actually go in and check out the nodes. And with the nodes, you can actually tie certain labels to them as I'm showing on the screen right now. And let's say you have a GPU node. Well, you can just put in like, you know, down if you want to, you can just say like for a label, we can just call it like GPU um, mega one or three or something like that, or GPU mega. And uh, whoops, let's make that little case. And I got to go in and figure out the nodes better, but you can actually tie certain node labels or certain labels to it. Um, and you can set it out so your pods, when you when you go to deploy your containers, it will only be associated with certain uh, labels. I got to look this up. I haven't touched that part in a while. But that way you can tie certain compute to certain hardware during the deployment cycle. Or certain OSs as well. If, like, say you have a mixed uh, cluster of Windows and uh, Linux uh, instances, and you have a Windows job that you want to run, you can uh, tie it to your Windows cluster or your Windows node so that it won't just blow up in your face and yell at you. Potentially. I have actually never tried that, but yes. Any... I, I've seen it done before, whether or not it's advisable. Yeah, I was going to say thank you for that last part. Wow. Um, so don't do that, ideally. But yes, it, if you need to differentiate any node, um, even if you want to have it just say looks funny as a, as a label, you could slap it on there and it'll look for anything that matches up that. I got to look up that, that match label stuff for nodes. Um, and I've never actually tried it with K3s, but I have done it with OpenShift. 
And also the idea behind the namespaces is uh, it definitely enables you to do a multi-tenant sort of space where mm -hmm. uh, your uh, client uh, running a WordPress site over in namespace one has no knowledge or ability in theory, long as uh, things are set up right, to be able to impact the, the client over in namespace two. Correct. What, what about logging uh, and uh, log analysis? You, okay, so in OpenShift and stuff like that, they tend to have like built in elk with it. But yes, you can put in logging in here and there is a way with the Kubernetes metrics to tie it in. So they have something called Fluentd and it's a uh, uh, cloud native uh, foundation uh, graduated project. So Fluentd can actually take all that information from your logging and you can have it set up. So it grabs all the traffic from the kubectl agent into a, uh, uh, a daemon set, which I'll fluent D, and that'll grow, all push over to your syslog. It'll it'll push to like a traditional like like regular logging system. Um, it'll push into L, uh, like a, a, an elk. It can push into Splunk. You name it, and you can set it up for grokking and whatever you want from each node. So that way you can set up so app, uh, um, so your applications team can use an elk set up someplace and track what's going on with their uh, with their containers. Um, for runtime and you can do metrics and alerting that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the better things for if you're just doing monitoring and you're not looking at like a deep history of what's going on, I recommend looking up the project Prometheus. It works really well with Fluentd and it's really good for um, grabbing uh, state uh, current state matrix metrics and getting more involved with the monitoring. And there are like Grafana dashboards you can tie with that too. You can also put on on uh, on cluster logging with it, which is what OpenShift will give you. Or did that not answer your logging question? <laughs> Dan, if you're trying to talk, you are on mute. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm on my iPhone, so it's. Uh, I, I was switching back and forth on some tasks or and uh, um, take care of some. The uh, well, the logging is. I'm uh, more, you know, I'm looking at two, three different things really. One is uh, a dashboard of where things are with uh, recent history, and then. Um, than the deeper history of, uh, of, you know, the sometimes you do with uh, various uh, web logging toolboxes. And then the, the other thing is for security um, and, and, and services. So like, so, if, so you'd have a service uh, log that would let you know for cyber attacks and stuff like that. You know, something, you know, akin to, uh, you know, a sunburst or something like that. Uh, if that go yeah, you can tie that in and um, specifically for those uh, questions for like security and ingress uh, related stuff. Um, I, well, I still recommend using an external load balancer uh, in- um, uh, I, I lost you in a reconnect there, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, to answer your question specifically for like, let's say doing like your cyber attacks, your DDoS detection, that kind of stuff. Um, well, I recommend using an external hardware load balancer like F5 or setting up HA proxy outside and monitoring and working that way. Um, what they do in OpenShift is they have uh, what they call in infrastructure nodes. And those are nodes that don't run any compute that you can handle, but they run things that are strictly for ingress. So you can run HA proxy there. And that's where all your exposed and traffic inside the cluster Will only go through those nodes of Kubernetes, and they're like highly available mode balancing. Uh, so, uh, so NGX uh, reverse proxies. Yes, you can put that on there, and you can designate infrastructure nodes. So you can tie it to certain hardware, so that way, when you're looking at the logs, you don't you're not looking at just any node. You can target to a certain set of nodes, and you can um, deploy them with certain names, and you can get that. And Fluentd will report the name and the activity and when and that kind of stuff. And depending on what you're using for your backend logging. Um, whatever syslog or if you're using logstash or 
you're using uh, Splunk, you can set it up to work with whatever there. And out of the box, they just use a lot of JSON, really easy to grok for your filters on your logging side. What did so you call those nodes? Uh, infrastructure nodes are what OpenShift calls them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can call them networking nodes when you're controlling it, you design it. But traditionally with OpenShift, you have master nodes which have to run core DNS or uh, core OS. And then you pay only for the worker nodes. So you pay for base license to worker nodes. And then your infrastructure nodes, your storage nodes. I don't know what they're doing in OpenShift 4, but in OpenShift 3, it was just work, it was just regular nodes. And as long as you don't have the compute tag or compute label on a node, you don't have to pay a license for that. Unless you're paying for like Gluster, then you'll get some charge for like storage nodes and stuff like that. They'll figure it out. But that's how they do it. I don't remember off the top of my head how Rancher's regular deployments work off the top of my head anymore. I've just been playing with K3 so much and they answer so many of my questions and needs. I don't mess with anything else. Yeah, K3S, uh, near as I can tell, it really does uh, follow that, like I was uh, saying, only the good parts of Kubernetes. With yeah. much hand waving. I'm going to shrink down the nodes, by the way, right now. So I'm going to do, on my end, I'm going to make it so I'm going to leave only three workers up and running. CubeCTO applied. And I if I did this right, um, well, I can't share my screen because I'm having, I'm using my phone like, you know, like you. Um, uh, you said you're going to shrink it down to three workers. I only see three workers. You well, I deleted all the other. Yeah. Uh, Terraform apply. So if this works out well, we shouldn't see any of these nodes die. Auto confirm. So I'm using uh, Terraform. Uh, I'm using Terraform and I'm gonna see if I can actually delete three of the other nodes and yep. All right. So I've actually removed nodes from the cluster and from Linode by using first you cordon a node, which will remove it from scheduling. And then to bring it back online, you uncordon. Then you drain the node of any current running systems, except for daemon sets. And then once you've let that run in the background for a while, you can delete the node or you can reboot it, doesn't matter. Um, and then when the node comes back online, you uncord on it and it will start scheduling pods on it as soon as it's back up and running. So that's generally what you would do if you're updating nodes on a on-prem or more of a persistent cluster. And that way you only need to have like a couple extra nodes and it'll handle the load balancing all in the background, all for you with all your workloads. Oh, also another thing too, is if you're making one megalithic cluster, Definitely work on label matching and make it so your QA people and test people are on different nodes or different hardware altogether, and they don't ruin the performance of anything production related. I've run across that one before where there's all these ways to, to, to segregate things, but people forget that in the end, hardware is limited and things get crazy. Oh, and also make sure that if you're going to be really pushing your cluster in terms of performance, this is especially for you, Andrew, make sure you set up the resource allocation for the host. It will not, I have seen it. So a node will go, oh no, I'm running out of memory. The OOM killer will pop up. It'll kill SSH and other valuable processes, but leave the Kubernetes agent on and some pods will start failing. It is the most annoying experience I've ever had. Yeah, thankfully the, the production, uh ish uh, clusters that I'm going to be dealing with here will be uh, managed by someone else. So it's not my fault when things break or at least not my problem. 
I don't care if you're an admin, DevOps, or developer. In the end, if there is a wall and you can't see over it, you have to trust them that they will do it right. Yes. And that's a fine detail that many people do not do right, despite even telling, I've done it. I've already skipped. I didn't even do that on this, and I should include in the install. It's been on my to-do list for a year and a half. Have I done it? Eh, not yet. <laughs> I put the fifth. I get it. There are only so many hours in the day. Exactly. All right. Any other questions after logging? While people are thinking, Andrew, can I stick in a uh, uh, reference to tomorrow night's St. Louis meeting? Sure. Go for it. You, you were kind <laughs> enough to let me uh, uh, plug uh, mine. Uh, not, not to joke about the Philadelphia folks there. <laughs> you have uh, Santa and, Claus and we don't have batteries, so don't worry. It wasn't really a joke. <laughs> uh, I'll stop me if Lee or James mentioned it earlier, but uh, the St. Louis slug meeting is tomorrow night. Uh, the topic is uh, kind of a, a, a small company, one person written bash script that goes in, reads configuration files and archives them so you can go back and you know, either do rollbacks or install a new system to the same configuration. Oddly enough, what he's been using this on for months has been his upgrade to CentOS 8. So as of last week with the CentOS 8 uh, frack going on, uh, he now has exactly what he needs to get off of CentOS 8. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think on the CentOS 8 side of things, uh, I, I'm going to sit tight for just a couple more months to see just exactly what shakes out and which clone of the CentOS world is going to end up winning. Whether I'm pushing for Rocky, making... Go ahead. It, whether it be Rocky or uh, one of the other ones. I'm pushing for making Arch Linux Enterprise in the cloud. That's my goal. I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to make it happen. The, the only heartburn I can see about Arch Linux is it tend, you tend to have a really bad time if you don't update uh, your packages often enough. Yeah, that used to be true. I don't have that problem except for a couple third party people because the third party uh, vendors can't keep up with some of the latest stuff I have on my system. So, but that's I'll, just my experience. And also, the other thing is, if I'm in charge of what's happening on the cloud and they're making my responsibility and they're complaining that CentOS is going away and they want something more up to date, I will give them something more up to date. Yeah. The, the biggest problem I can see is I know of places that use uh, CentOS as a, well, we, we need to run IBM-ish stuff, and uh, we don't want to pay for Red Hat for uh, all the, the licenses that we need to have, so we'll just run the Red Hat-like system in production. Right, and in the cloud, it's just a small upcharge per hourly for the license. So even then some organizations don't want to deal with that. Um, and most development systems that we have internally in the company are all CentOS. So they're all complaining. So you know, it's, it'll be fine, I, but yeah. I get it. Uh, one, one of the big questions comes here is uh, they, they have a lot to prove of themselves of just how stable uh, CentOS stream will end up being. I mean, honestly, it's just going to be ahead of Red Hat Enterprise Linux releases by like two or three weeks. So should be fine. And, well, the, the problem is if they're using them as the, the punching bag to uh, test and see if they broke anything. Still fine, in my opinion. Yeah, in the end, you get what you pay for. People complain about Arch, and I think it's solid. So to me, a streaming distro that's a little bit more up to date than Red Hat, I think is a win. I think Red Hat's too far behind the times. It does definitely feel like the old Debian uh, back in the days before they, they bumped their version up. Yeah, it, it definitely feels like that. It's more of a hurdle to write for older packages 
and it's terrible because you're like, oh, the the features I want are in a release that were like a year ago, and it's still not in Red Hat. But a while. Yeah. Uh, try try being uh, bound. Or multiple years ago, and then yeah. yeah, and then having the place that you work or <clears throat> study, and they are just moving from you know, X to Y. I mean, when I was there, it was six to seven, but now seven to eight and and everything you're dealing with at home is past where eight is, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why I argue trying to get Arch back in the, or the Arch to uh, the office, at least for a uh, um, development purpose, because you're literally miles ahead of anything in production. And you can always put newer packages on a system, but if you ever want to make a sysadmin angry, Convincing them to try to install a package that is, you know, or to uh, roll back installations just so your software works is one of the most painful experiences as an admin. So in my opinion, I'd rather go forward because things are better to are known better to work and have all the nice features that I've heard about. And I don't have to sit there and be like, oh, I have to write around this. Even it's like you're, you're basically developing new software for end of life libraries. Try still having stuff in uh, somewhat sunset uh, production in a certain place I know of that has uh, still is running Sent6. We and still have I stuff th running on RHEL 4 in production in a data center that wants to get moved to the cloud. Trust me, we're feeling it. And also Python 2. Oh, don't remind me. Did you know that within the last 12 months of Python 2's um, end of life, that certain universities that aren't in Iowa were still teaching Python 2 as the mandatory version to, of Python to learn? Oh, that's just malpractice. Yay, Drexel. I believe it. Um... 